So today's subject is religiosity and spirituality. <clears throat> In a more popular way, we can put it as religion and spirituality. Often, religion is misunderstood, widely misunderstood these days. One of the ongoing debates in international stage right now among humanists is whether religion has any place at all in the life of modern man. There are many radical humanists, some of them outstanding journalists, some of them great scientists, <coughs> social workers. <coughs> They question the status of organized religions, any religion for the matter. If you read their books, if you listen to their lectures, you understand that they are not bad people. Many of them are very, very good uh, well-wishers of mankind. They are humanists. But their humanism is somewhat radical in his approach towards the problems of modern man. And they often criticize religion as being divisive, often lopsided, dogmatic, and religion as an ideology, not just a way of life, but an ideology that has divided mankind into mutually warring groups of believers and non-believers. They quote uh, different instances, various instances, episodes from the history of religious thought, religious traditions. The Crusades, the Inquisitions, the wars, the Thirty Years' War, then the social injustices in the name of casteism, in the name of non-belief, Jihad, people who fight on behalf of God, who claim to fight on behalf of God and on behalf of religion, who shed the blood of the innocents, thinking that that's one way to go to heaven. Of course, these days, except in very, very tribalistic religious traditions, this approach is not at all fashionable. It is, uh, it is widely contemned. But still, uh, s some other humanists will argue that religion, by its very nature, is against the spirit of science and reason, that we don't need a transcendental authority, moral authority, to impose his rule on, this, on humanity. We can have our own way of life. So there is no need to depend upon a transcendental moral authority, a creator God, for inspiration of guidance. These are some of the views which are very common and very difficult to refute, very difficult to uh, reject for any reasonable mind. Now, what are the causes for this widespread condemnation of organized religions? <clears throat> As I already hinted, there have been more wars and conflicts in the name of religion and on behalf of God than on behalf of or in the name of any other ideology till 20th century. According to modern historians, till 20th century, most of the wars were fought for God. But in 20th century, three radical uh, streams of thought influenced humanity. One was communism, the communist revolution in Soviet Union, in Russia, 1917, and then the revolution in China, which were both human attempts to worship Uh, the brutal collective power, the collective brutal power of humanity, devoid of any moral or religious or spiritual trappings. 
both proved to be total failures. The third approach was in Europe, fascism and nazism represented another non-religious approach, which also became disastrous in their consequences. So, except for these three modern uh, ideological trends, all other conflicts till the beginning of 20th century took place in the name of religion and on behalf of God. So do we need a God? Do we need a religion? That's the question. Now, what, is nor what do we normally mean by religion? Vivekananda, who interpreted religion as spirituality, and who defined spirituality as going beyond the trappings of organized religion, says that religion has got four levels in its evolution. At the most primitive, at the grossest level, religion is understood to be the performance, mechanical performance of certain rituals, ceremonies, and the profession of faith, which may not necessarily have anything to do with our real life. So it is very superficial. We profess to be a Hindu, a Catholic, or Protestant, or Muslim, or Jew, and so on. It's just a profession. Oh, we write in a column, what's your religion? Hindu, Christian, Muslim, Jew, or Buddhist, and so on. That's what is religion. And also certain external ceremonies and rituals go into it temple, a church, or a mosque, or whatever, maybe on fixed days, performance of some rituals, mechanical performance of some rituals, which may not necessarily have anything to do with our approach towards life, our attitude towards our fellow human beings, completely divorced from the real, the real life. This is the grossest, the most primitive level of religion. Swami Vivekananda said, rituals and mythology, which corresponds to what we understand by theology also. So rituals and mythology represent two of the most primitive levels of human evolution in religious life. But we can't say these things are not necessary because we had to start somewhere. Spiritual life should have a beginning somewhere. So instead of going for a walk in the evening in the beach, we go to a temple, a church. Instead of watching the TV, some thrillers, we watch, we go to a Church, a temple or a church, they listen to some lectures about ethics, morality, philosophy, and higher values. See, this is certainly better, no doubt about it. But it is only beginning. It is not the end. When you interpret this as the supreme goal of religion, then it is called religiosity. So what is religiosity? Religiosity is nothing but a peculiar approach to religion which is essentially lopsided, dogmatic, and doctrinal, which becomes a stumbling block in our spiritual progress. It's like a child who goes to kindergarten who refuses to move to higher classes. When he reaches a particular age, he has to move to a higher class. He can't go on attending a kindergarten or a primary school for 20 years or 30 years. You can't do that. Similarly, we have to start somewhere and rituals and ceremonies and mythologies could be a very beginning, could be an ideal beginning, but we should not interpret, uh, interpret this beginning as the end of spiritual life. 
if we do interpret it becomes dogma and one very serious problem of this approach which is called religiosity is that it leads to conflicts and confrontations because there can there cannot be any unity or harmony there cannot be any common ground at the level of rituals and ceremonies because a person reads the religious scriptures of his chosen path his chosen faith so a muslim may go to a muslim place of worship hindu may go to a temple christian may go to a church jew may go to a synagogue and so on so there is a lot of diversity and difference at this level but this difference should be understood because this is only the beginning of spiritual life and there comes a stage where these diversities and differences vanish when we move higher in spiritual evolution so rituals and mythologies constitute the first and second levels of evolution in in religious life <clears throat> as i said earlier there are more conflicts and diversities at this level than com- than common factors the third stage is philosophy which may perhaps include theology as well well at the philosophical level there can be some common ground in all religious philosophies at least in the philosophical teachings of the great mystics you find many common ideas love compassion universalism non violence peace harmony universal brotherhood all these are common ideas common philosophical doctrines that are found in most of the organized religions this is the beginning of spirituality now at this level there may be many common factors many unifying factors many commonalities between different religious persuasions but still there won't be perfect harmony and peace because philosophical ideas and theological ideas are often determined by the cultural the geographical and the ethnic ideas related to the life the activities and the culture into which the particular prophet or the founder of the particular religion is born every religious teacher has to interpret his doctrines and ideas in a vocabulary using a vocabulary and a language a term in certain certain common terms expressions which uh, may be determined by the language in which into which he is born the geographical area which often influences culture and attitudes and behavior patterns food habits and so on so the sociological factors the geographical factors the characteristics of the particular ethnic tribe into which this prophet is born may very often influence the language the parables the similes that he may use while interpreting his teachings the teachings may be universal in nature but the language used may not be universal because language has its own difficulties it's a common uh, argument by mod- among modern philosophers that language is often an ina- inadequate tool for expressing higher philosophical truths so um in all religious teachings in the teachings of all religious prophets and teachers you find this limitation the limitation a is not their fault it's n- you can't put the blame on them the limitation is totally unavoidable what is the limitation the limitations imposed by the 
sociological factors, the social customs and conventions and traditions of the people among whom the prophet is born. He has to interpret the universal spiritual truth in the particular language using the phraseology and the terminology of that partic the particular society or the ethnic tribe into which he is born. The culture, the geography, all this. They, they are secondary details. So therefore, philosophy also doesn't constitute the supreme goal of religious life. But philosophy can be helpful because it can give us a glimpse into some of the common spiritual ideas, universal ideas in different religious traditions. The fourth and highest stage is experience. So, as I said earlier, the grossest and the most primitive stage is external rituals, then mythological beliefs and customs, then philosophy, and last is experience, which corresponds to mysticism in the Judo-Christian context. In the context of Abrahamic religions, experience corresponds more or less the mysticism that is often found among the mystical teachings of the great men and women of God who lived in the medieval ages. So, at this level, at the experience level, religion ceases to be religiosity, it becomes spirituality. If you interpret spirituality as mere religion, it becomes binding. It becomes a bondage, a burden, a liability for human civilization, as it often proved to be. And then it becomes divisive. At the individual level, it becomes a stumbling block in the spiritual progress of the individual. I can give an example. Generally speaking, religion consists of do's and don'ts. You should do certain things. You should not do certain other things. Because that's the... Uh, that, that's arbitrarily... Uh, stressed or emphasized in a particular religious theological work. So you have to believe in certain things. You have to think in a certain way, in a given way, and you have to perform religious rituals in a given manner. If you do not do that, you are punishable, punishable by death during the Middle Ages. Now, so you can very easily see how and why religion came to be so terribly misunderstood as divisive, as creating more problems than good for mankind. But the same religion, when it reaches the peak of its evolution, it becomes a universal, a unifying, a harmonizing spiritual attitude towards life as a whole, at the individual level, it helps us to reach a higher spiritual evolution. And in our interaction with, the, with other fellow human beings, it helps us to look upon other fellow human beings with love, compassion, and a feeling of brotherhood. So the same religion ceases to be religion, it becomes spirituality at the experience level. But unfortunately, very often, and in many religious traditions, this experience element was completely ignored. And those who openly advocated the primacy of inner mystical experience were often persecuted and excommunicated, very often uh, subjected to persecution and death. Now, 
What is the essence of this experience? I have again at the beginning I said two points about this experience. This experience, to begin with, it helps us to enjoy peace and harmony within. It helps us to fulfill and to rediscover our own spiritual element within. We realize that God, that the God whom we are seeking outside, is actually sitting within all of us. This will be a terrible blasphemy at the mythological and ritualistic level. But this is a matter of every moment experience at the experience level. We respect, we honor, we worship a Jesus or a Buddha or a Ramakrishna, Paramahamsa, because they reach this level of experience, inner experience. And while rediscovering our own inner spiritual personality by, by realizing the immanent divine spirit within, it also helps us to realize that the same immanent reality, immanent divine spirit, is also the all-pervading spiritual truth. So, as an immanent reality, it resides in all human beings. So, all human beings are essentially divine. All other identities are impositions, superimpositions. In reality, the kingdom of God is the birthright of every human being. A God of Jesus doesn't exist for Christians alone. The God of Hindus doesn't exist for Hindus alone. A God of other religions also exists for the whole humanity. So the division into those who believe in a religion and those who do not believe in religion vanishes at the level of the highest peak of spiritual evolution, which is called experience. <clears throat> now, this approach which is essentially Vedantic approach, was for the first time expounded in modern times by Swami Vivekananda. In fact, he was actually contributing a new religious paradigm to world religious thought by interpreting religion as spirituality. The word paradigm itself has a great uh, significance, you know. Paradigm shift was the term used by uh, the famous physicist Thomas Kuhn, who was teaching in Berkeley in the well-known book that the, the structure of scientific revolutions, that's a famous book, maybe it was published in 1962. It became one of the landmark publications of those days the structure of scientific revolutions. So, according to him, the scientific discoveries, progress, doesn't take place in a continuous stretch of unbroken succession. He says, scientific discoveries can be interpreted into different phases in the evolution of scientific knowledge. So, at each stage, there is a paradigm shift in, in, our scientific, in, in our attitude, in our total attitude towards science and towards scientific knowledge. Now, if you apply this term into Vivekananda's contribution to religious thought, we could say that Swami Vivekananda's definition of religion as spirituality and nothing less and nothing more is a paradigm shift. It marks a paradigm shift. You have to remember, these ideas were not his creation. Swami Vivekananda said again and again that whatever he preached, whatever he taught was from the Upanishads. I preached nothing but the Upanishads. I'm just quoting his own words. The Upanishads do not speak about a creator God. The Upanishads do not speak about hell and heaven. The Upanishads do not speak about belief or non-belief. 
the Upanishad does it, doesn't divide mankind into believers and non-believers. The Upanishad only speaks about the one supreme spirit that is the essence of every living being, not only human beings, that is immanent in all human beings, and that is the ultimate transcendental reality. And that is also the all-pervading, omnipresent reality. So that's why Vivekananda said, the Upanishads do not speak about religion, the Upanishads speak about spirituality. And what is spirituality? Spirituality is nothing but a kind of universal spiritual humanism. If you can think of a religion which is universal in nature, in application, it is Vedanta, it is this, because Vedanta doesn't signify a religion, it signifies the essence and the totality of all human spiritual aspirations at the peak of their evolution. But it doesn't reject or it doesn't decry, it doesn't belittle the rituals and ceremonies. But it gives a strong warning that we should not start that we should start with rituals, but we should not end with rituals. Rituals should be a good beginning. Rituals should not be the end. Uh, to quote Vivekananda, uh, he says, it is good to, uh, to, to be born in a church, but it is terrible to die there. That is his expression. Church here doesn't necessarily mean a Christian church or anything. Church here stands for a man-made institution. And a man-made structure of beliefs, of customs and habits and conventions. That's what is meant by church. This should be understood very clearly. What Vivekananda meant was, church, church corresponds to a man-made structure, a place of worship, belief in a particular book, and the belief that book alone contains the truth, and God cannot be approached directly, but only through the medium of a priest. And God is sitting above the clouds, watching our activities, with a big stick in his hand, ready to punish if we don't follow his dictates, and ready to reward the promised land, heaven, if we follow him. That's what is meant by church. So Vivekananda says, it is good to be born in a church. You have to start somewhere. So let us, we can start with reading the Bible, the Gita, or any religious holy book. Very fine. But then we should end with, the, with, with experiencing the truth that is explained, that is described in these religious books. So belief is not a criterion for spirituality. Experience is the criterion of spirituality. Belief becomes a criterion for belief, for, for, for religion. And if belief alone becomes the criterion for religion, then religion will continue to be divisive, to be rather a source of trouble than a source of help and guidance. But we should start with religion. Somewhere we have to begin and slowly we must evolve and our goal, supreme goal should be to end with inner experience. It is this experience that translates religion into spirituality. One great complaint against organized religion in modern times, and in fact it all began with Marx and Engels in the, begin, in the middle of 19th century. Remember, you have to look upon Marx not as a, as the champion or the proponent of communist ideology. You must look upon Marx as a great Hegelian, as a great socio-economic, political scientist and thinker and a philosopher. That you have to remember this very well. Marx had nothing to do with whatever political ideology that later on came to evolve under his name. Marx was totally innocent of all these things. So look upon him as a thinker as a socio-economic, political thinker and scientist. 
Now, he criticized religion. His only criticism was that it is anti-humanistic. And he was, what religion was he criticizing? He used the word religion is an opium. The religion that made people blindly believe in certain things, that closed the doors and windows of God before a certain section of people, that admitted only a chosen group of people to, give to God's kingdom and denied entry to the rest of humanity. That was the kind of religion which he designated as opium. So it all began with Marx, and it continues to our own times. Great humanists and scientists like Richard Dawkins, journalist I make, Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens, who passed away. All these are modern examples of great humanists who criticize religion. Perhaps they, if they had opportunity to read the works of Vivekananda and if they had got a chance to have an encounter with Vedanta, they would not have criticized religion at all. Because Vedanta is the greatest philosophy of humanism. Vivekananda says in one of his lectures, the infinite one, the, in, in the infinite oneness of the soul is the eternal sanction of all morality, all ethics, all good actions. So what is, the, what is the highest philosophy of morality and ethics? He says the infinite oneness of the soul. In other words, the fact, the truth that humanity is one. The humanity is one spiritual family. This oneness and this concept of unity based on the fact that God, as the divine spirit, lives within all of us. And to realize this fact is the goal of true religion. And then religion becomes spirituality. And it becomes a unifying force. So, we should not do harm to our neighbor, not because God will punish us. Or, we should do charity because God will reward us. No. We should not hurt our neighbor and we should help our neighbor not out of fear of God but out of the realization that our neighbor and ourselves are spiritually one. This is the essence of uh, Vedanta. In fact, this is the universal ethical philosophy of Vedanta which Vivekananda advocated. Now, this is in fact what is meant by spirituality. In other words, spirituality is nothing but the realization that the divine spirit, the God whom we are seeking outside, is actually living within us. Then the question may arise, why should we go to places of worship? Why should we listen to lectures? Why should we read holy books? It is necessary. Because... That's the beginning. If a, ba if a child uh, asks the question, why should I go to school, where well, we should tell him or her, you have to learn the alphabet at the beginning. Without that, you cannot make further progress. You have to begin somewhere, and kindergarten is the only place you can begin. There is no other place. If a child doesn't go to the kindergarten or primary school, he may start wandering in the streets and he may end up being an illiterate, maybe a liability to human society. So he should start somewhere. He should go to primary school. He should go to kindergarten. Like that, we all should start somewhere. But we should not interpret the primary school as the highest educational institution in the world. That's the only point. Now, in the, that's why in the Bhagavad Gita, there is a famous verse. The verse in one of his super commentaries gives an insight into the problem of religiosity. The verse is the Yukta Hari Viharasya Yukta Chestasya Karma Su Yukta Suknavabodhasya Yugo Bhavadi Dukha. This is the famous verse. The verse stresses the ideal of moderation in everything. In our habits, activities, all our habits, like eating habits, 
you know, food habits, everything. Moderation is the essence of yoga. Because if we go into extremes, it upsets the balance. Now, you find certain people professing religion, or religiosity rather. They would tell you, well, they will they would fast on fixed days, and they will not drink even a drop of water on certain given sacred holy occasions. And they will rigorously perform some rigorous religious practices. And they become very proud of it. So, uh, one commentator on this verse says, what happens to a person who doesn't practice moderation in eating habits? Suppose a person goes on fasting continuously. Not people like Gandhi, mind you. Gandhi doesn't belong to the ordinary type of... He could fa fast for 21 days and remain cheerful and calm. But if a, com if an, if an, if a common man, if an average person goes about fasting for too long, what happens? Slowly, he becomes... See, I'm fasting. I'm so ascetic in my habits... And see, that fellow is eating four times a day. So he is not spiritual. I am spiritual. I'm... This is called religiosity. On the other hand, a spiritually evolved person, if he fasts, that doesn't make him proud of his fasting or his ascetic habits. A person who is not spiritually fit for that kind of extreme spiritual practices, if he turns to extreme spiritual practices like asceticism, it becomes a very serious burden to him. In fact, it will take him away from God. Rather, he will be always thinking about other people who are eating food, which means that he really wants to eat food. There's an interesting story in P.G. Woodhouse, not a very likely reference book, but uh, if you can read it, you will understand uh, the, the peeling uh, of an orange, you know. But the story is this. Uh, one fellow, you know, a good-for-nothing young man, that's a typical Buddhist character, mind you. He was advised by his doctor to start on a rigorous diet. He should eat, you stop eating meat and fish and things like that. So the only food that he was allowed was half an orange twice a day. So with great gest gesture, he started uh, his dieting habit and he started only eating half an orange twice a day. On the first day, he felt so fine. His stomach was quite peaceful. He was very happy, jolly. On the second day, he became restless. On the third day, he became so violent that instead of doing any good to him, he became he he became a, so a nuisance to his neighbors and his friends. So the story ends that one day, the third or fourth day, his friend came calling on him, and he chased him out of the home because his eating habit had made him so hungry. And when he became hungry, he became angry. And that didn't do any good to him. So Buddha says at the end of the story, the best way to make Gandhi peaceful is to make him eat four square meals every day. Then he will stop all this non-violence, non this uh, civic movement. I mean, he was trying to organize Indians against the British Empire. And the struggle for independence. So Gandhi was doing a lot of, creating a lot of problems for British rulers. So Woodhouse, in his humorous way, tells that Gandhi should be asked to eat four square meals every day. There'll be no problem for British Empire. That's what he says. Now, what really happens is in the story behind, any ascetic practice, any external ritual, religious ritual, carried to an extreme point, and interpreted as an end in itself, will make the man irritable, and it will rather take him away from God and spirituality, rather than doing anything good to him. The central message. So Krishna says, yukta ahara viharasya yukta chestrasya karmaso. But if you interpret religion as religiosity, 
then many people interpret this external practice of asceticism as an end in itself on the one hand it creates disturbance within on the other hand it creates disharmony and it also becomes the cause of so much of violence and bloodshed and disturbances in the name of religion and god on the other hand if religion is interpreted as spirituality as the inner experience of the divine spirit the immanent reality within the entire living humanity the whole creation and also the all pervading supreme reality then it becomes spiritually humanistic it becomes a unifying a harmonizing a synthesizing a peace giving spiritual way of life that is the difference between religiosity and spirituality so vivekananda says true religion should be interpreted as spirituality alone religion is a manifestation of divinity already in man true religion is spirituality what is that it is a manifestation of divinity already in man the moment we realize the presence of the divine within us we, be- we become better human beings we become better family members we interact with our colleagues in the workplaces much with greater harmony and peace we become better citizens in other words we become better human beings on the other hand if religion is interpreted as religiosity it creates conflicts and problems for the whole mankind this is the difference between religiosity and spirituality religion is sometimes interpreted as mere piety external piety we sometimes makes us insensitive towards the problems of our fellow human beings highly individualistic interpretation of spiritual progress a strong faith in in a book in a doctrine i am god i am i have a very good understanding with god but that understanding makes me more intolerant more insensitive towards the problems of others that is what is called religiosity so vivekananda in inspired talks gives a glimpse into what really happens when we interpret uh, religion as religiosity he says if a man comes and tells you that he is inspired and talks nonsense reject him that these are his own words in inspired talks we see delivered in one thousand island park if a man comes and tells you that is inspired and talks nonsense reject him what is meant by nonsense here somebody comes and tells you well god has told me to do certain things i have a private encounter dialogue with god so well if that claim makes him more humane more compassionate more understanding more broad minded we may accept him but then next sentence he says well you should all follow me or i shall kill you my path is the real path all others are wrong then swami vegananda says reject him so that is the real criterion if religion makes us better human beings it is spirituality if religion makes us narrow minded it is religiosity if religion makes us lopsided insensitive to other people problems a cold totally insensitive expression on the face absolutely all the doors and windows are closed the humanity remains outside without any access to you and you claim to be spiritually in- inspired it is nothing but insanity or it is not or religiosity so vivekananda says true religion is spirituality and true religion makes us more humane humanistic broad minded and sensitive kind of spiritual sensitivity that's why you find all the great religious teachers of the world and also all the great prophets and saints they were intensely humane spiritually humane see very often in sanskrit there is a verse that is quoted yad bhavayadi tad bhavati this is a simple pithy expression it really means whatever you contemplate upon whatever you meditate upon whatever you think about that you become very easily you can see 
A boy who wants to become a footballer, he keeps his room decorated with, with photos of great football players. A boy who, or a girl who wants to become a musician will have the photos, the pictures of great musicians decorated in his room. Like that. Th those whom we meditate upon, we admire, we tend to become like that. Similarly, if you really think about God, if you really contemplate on God, then we should have some of godly qualities in our character and behavior. If on the one hand you say God is all merciful, is compassionate, and we also become the opposite of that, then there is an inner dis uh, dichotomy, disharmony, a disconnect, so to speak. If we love and worship and meditate upon God, then we should be godly in our thoughts, actions, and behavior. We cannot just, on the one hand, claim that we believe in God and then become the opposite of that. It's not possible. That's why all the great mystics, men and women of God, men and women who have realized the highest spiritual truth in their life, they became almost like God. That's why they are venerated as prophets and incarnations. So maybe the grandest and greatest example who lived close to our own times is Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa himself. Every moment he was communicating with God. And he himself became God to many people. He is considered to be an incarnation. That's the real psychology of the, the tradition of worshipping human beings and incarnations, by constant meditation upon God, they themselves become godly. That means the meditation was genuine and true. On the other hand, if we, on the one hand, claim to worship an all-merciful, compassionate God, at the same time, we also have no compassion, no brotherhood, then we may be meditating on somebody else other than God. That's what what should we assume. So, if you read the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, you will get a clear picture and a correct understanding of what is meant by true spirituality. Thank you. Namaskar.